Hi everyone, welcome back to TTT, Talking Transport Transformation, brought to you by TUI, the Transformative Urban Mobility Initiative. We were thrilled to be at the conference center Leipzig Zoo on May 22nd for the setup of our highly anticipated TUMI 2023 conference on feminist voices in transport. It was a real honor to engage in conversation with Robin Chase, an esteemed speaker at our conference. Robin Chase's influential work and contribution to the transportation sector earned her recognition as one of the distinguished recipients of the TUMI and Women Mobilize Women Award for Remarkable Feminist Voices in transport. Robin Chase is a transportation entrepreneur. She co-founded numerous companies aiming to bring sustainability into the mobility system. She is the co-founder and former CEO of Zipcar, the world's largest car sharing company, as well as Buscar in France, the online ride sharing community Go Loco and the network company Venium. On top of that, Robin founded NUMO, the New Urban Mobility Alliance, a non-profit global alliance whose target is to channel tech-based innovations in the transportation sector to create more just and sustainable cities. Robin was a member of the advisory board at the World Resources Institute. And today, she is chairperson at Tucos. And as such, she is part of the Dutch multinational DSM's Sustainability Advisory Board. In this captivating episode, we delve into the importance of listening to a diverse range of women's experience to foster a more equitable approach to mobility, but also recognizing that the solutions we seek must go beyond gender-specific considerations and encompass the needs of all individuals. We envision a future where people of all ages and income levels can enjoy the autonomy of free movement, which has been compromised by our car-centric cities. To reclaim the freedom of mobility and move away from car dependency, our guest highlights the potential of electric bikes and the importance of pilot projects serving as crucial strategies to create people-friendly urban environments. Robin boldly states that relying only on electric private cars will not suffice in tackling the pressing climate crisis. We explore the complexities associated with overcoming resistance to new solutions while highlighting the significance of responsible data utilization. Robin emphasizes the potential of data collection to enhance transportation but underscores the need to prioritize privacy and transparency. Finally, our guest draws inspiration from young professionals who are revolutionizing transport systems through fresh perspectives and groundbreaking approaches. Without any further introduction, let us immerse ourselves in this truly inspiring episode. So welcome Robin Chase to the TTT podcast. We are really excited to have you here in Leipzig at the TUMI conference location. It's a pleasure to be here, really. You are one of our Feminist Voices in Transport 2023. Congratulations. Therefore, I wanted to ask you about finding your voice and if there was ever a moment in your career where you faced some adversity but found your voice nonetheless. Those are good questions. I'm a person who has three children. I think people have their own um, personalities. And I think I have always been someone who is ready to express my opinion at any moment. So I feel like I'm mostly not a person who um, has felt voiceless. But I will say that when I did Zipcar, I really didn't know a lot about transportation. What I knew was, here's the service that I'd like to create. And so I'm thoughtful about why one might want to have it. After I had been CEO for a couple of years, um, I became a fellow at Harvard, and I spent that year educating myself about transportation policy and urban planning policy. And that was incredibly important because suddenly I could say with confidence, or I could use words, that before I really didn't know the history or the whys. And so I feel that we can because the internet exists, we can spend time and educate ourselves and learn to be confident with terms or backgrounds or history. And as I'm telling this story, I also went to business school, and I think that was the thing that I learned out of business school, is that people could say their fancy words and do all their stuff, and I would think, I know those words. 
you can't, you know, you can't be making me intimidated. And so I feel like that is what I did spend time because I do respect people's expertise. And so once I had gotten, I spent a year doing graduate level work of around transportation and urban, urban planning, things snapped into place and I felt much more comfortable. That said, I'm always ready to know where I don't know about things and I'm listening to others. So I'm in a constant self-education mode and sometimes have to be re-educated if I had the wrong idea to begin with. So I, I believe in educating yourself and listening to others and then feeling power in what you're doing. That sounds like a healthy balance between, you know, standing firm in your expertise and feeling this sort of confidence from that, but also lifelong learning on the other side of it. Absolutely. And and when I was doing Sipcar, what was I was so struck was as a company, I thought we knew more than car manufacturers how people actually used their cars. And I felt very comfortable on that. And I was so shocked that these other auto executives didn't know about it. And so I would be happy to in instruct them mm -hmm. <laughs> on how people would, <laughs> on, on how. And I, just thinking about um, this conference and the role of women, and this is what I'll be talking about tomorrow, is that we do have different life experiences. That means there are things that we can talk about with knowledge and with confidence that men might not even have ever noticed before. It's, it's frightening to speak in stereotypes because they are stereotypes. It's not all women, it's not all men. But on balance, the sexes do have different life experiences and so therefore see and experience the world differently. And whenever we talk about feminism, we also want to think about racism as well, right? So we have to acknowledge that there are these different ways of living in the world that we, in our own gender or in our own race or in our own socioeconomic class, might not ever notice or be invisible to us. And so we need to have that inclusion in transportation. I think that's a, an amazing point you made. And I think that's also something that you touched upon in the book that we published about all of the remarkable feminist voices in transport, in which there was an interview featured with you. And you also spoke about changing perspectives and making sure that you see beyond your own horizon. So I was going to ask you, in your experience, um, how do you keep making sure that you get these other perspectives that might not be, you know, inherent to how you experience the world and also what maybe can other transport planners or entrepreneurs learn from you working in diverse teams over the years? I think in the last few years, and sadly that it is in the last few years, all of us should be recognizing very clearly that we don't whoever we are, we don't represent everyone and that we need other people in the room. And that should be a out of the gate checklist for each one of us in our, as we are espousing things that we think we know and that we might well know, but for whom do we know all of it? Do we know everyone's life experience? And so I feel like it should be part of our own personal checklists you know, note to self, as I'm giving this talk or as I'm expressing some strong opinion, do I, am I expressing opinion for, for whom and who's not included in that and who should be sitting here at this table? So I think women, if we think of your, ourselves growing up and then going to university or starting things professionally, I think we've all experienced moments where we're kind of taken aback, like, wait up, what you just said, does not match my life experience or you're not noticing this entire thing that seems obvious to everyone that I know. And so we should take that reflection and say, oh, if I notice that and how I live the world, how are other people noticing it and experiencing it when I'm saying things? And so I'm definitely trying to do better at it. And I feel like I've always paid attention, but I don't think I've paid enough attention. That is a very good reminder, yeah, to always 
reflect critically on your own perspective from which you're speaking, no matter who you are. I think there's always blind spots that we have. And as I've been doing companies, I want to say there's certain things that we work from our own life, our own life and work experience. And so you think to yourself, oh, I did it this way last time. I know all about this now, so I'm going to do it this way again. And then, in fact, that, that doesn't work out. So you have to say, oh, wait, wait up. What was the piece of, that I should have learned that I missed that learning because I'm making some mistake again? So as I say, I'm constantly on the lookout for, oh, I thought I had learned the right lesson, but maybe there was something in there that clearly I had missed because I'm now experiencing how I had missed it. So even our own life experience where we think, yeah, I'm really good at this, or I know this thing inside out, and then suddenly you think, oh my gosh, that was an amazing comment that person said, or wow, I'd never ever thought of it from that perspective. Mm -hmm. So I'm always trying to be mindful that that can happen at any minute and to make sure that I'm open to that. And I know that um, you're very interested and excited about data-driven solutions for mobility. So would you say that data collection and analysis is also one way that we can learn more about other perspectives and take into account more mobility experiences? Data is such a complex topic, isn't it? That we talked for years, remember the words about big data, big data, and then we had smart cities and smart transportation, and now all the privacy issues that result. So I feel like it's a very deep and complex issue. So data is a big word and there's lots that's encompassed in it. But for sure, demographics, use, how people use things, what works and what doesn't work as you watch people use systems, all of that is so much easier to find, analyze, and adjust when you have data. So it's a way that we can be responsive and learn things very quickly with data. So I am a huge believer in data and doing things that are fact-based for sure. Then there is this flip side that particularly in our realm of transportation, every single movement that I make can now be tracked and analyzed on my smartphone. And as I, when we think about all the things I love, shared transportation, so shared bikes, shared scooters, shared cars, shared public transit, all of that is now a source of data collection that can be extremely, the word private, I don't even, I don't even want people to think, oh, I don't mind if people know. They shouldn't know. Just basically we're humans. We should be able to move independently without people knowing every single one of your movements. So there's this very fine balance. Um, NUMO, the new Urban Mobility Alliance, worked with National Association of Bike, NABSA, and um, some others. And we worked for several months with a group of people to and organizations to develop the privacy principles for mobility data. And it was a way to for us to get what we need out of the data with mobility and yet preserve privacy. And so some basic principles are how long you need to keep that data and you should throw it away as quickly as you can. How much data do you actually need? Instead of collecting all this stuff and then you never ever look at it, but you might one day want it, don't do that. Just collect the data that you actually need. And do the people from whom you're collecting the data know that you're doing it? They need to know. Um, so just to be much more transparent, collect as little data as possible, know what you're gonna use it for, and then throw it out as fast as possible. So there's a whole bunch of data that we can aggregate. But I'm particularly interested in us being overt and knowledgeable or thoughtful about data as we move into the future. Because as I said, for all shared transport, we are collecting a lot of data. And then as we move to correct negative externalities associated with cars or to get them to cars to pay better user fees, so going from fuel taxes to distance taxes, it will now also expand the knowledge of where vehicles move moment by moment. And so I, I think we do need to do those things. We do need to have a distance taxes for, for cars and congestion pricing for cars, as well as we need to have shared bikes and scooters and public transport. We need to be very thoughtful about our data practices with that and make sure that they cannot be repurposed there's been a lot of discussion and controversy 
over whether things like electric scooters or electric bikes reporting to the city in real time the trajectory of each individual vehicle. And it's been said, oh, it's anonymized. But, but with transportation, when you know the origin and destination of someone, it's, you can re- de-anonymize that in seconds. I'm absolutely pro-data and to improve our transportation access and improve it as ongoing, but we need to do it with incredible care, that we need to be very thoughtful about what's the least data we need to collect. Let's keep it for as little as possible, and let's anonymize it as quickly as possible. Like, you don't need to know actually per person. You might need to know per 10 people or per this geography, but it doesn't have to be individual by individual. We will certainly link the principles in the show notes so everybody can have a look at that. I would like to shift now to the topic of equitable mobility because it's a topic of our conference here in Leipzig at To Me 2023. And first, I would like to ask you, why is mobility such an important factor for equal participation in society. Remember when I started this, we talked about being open to other ways people move through the world, that we represent one thing. Something, when we talk about equity, I think there's a whole bunch of people who want to say, equity doesn't matter to me because I actually have a lot of money and I'm living in a space that has public transit and it's unrelated to me and my life. So equity is a thing I'm doing for others. I think we should do it for others. But I think that we should also recognize that transportation is for all of our points in life, that we are babies and have to be carried everywhere. We are school children who could get to school without your parent driving you, whether you're rich or poor. You could be a young student and have no money. You could have a broken leg. You could have your mother who's 97 and can't do long stairs. And so public transit was very hard. So we need to look at it and think over the course of everyone's life, including your own life, there is no one mode that will ever, ever do the trick for everything. And so this idea of equity in transportation, which I'm a profound believer in, and we should be doing it for others, but we should recognize we're also doing it for ourselves, that we all live through different life stages and different income levels and different ability levels. The world now has eight billion people on it and cars and getting yourself around by cars is never ever going to be the answer for the eight billion people in all their life phases. And yeah, so I look at it and it's, I want it to not feel like a politically correct or even a, I do think it's morally correct, but I want people to also realize that it's for themselves, their own selves, that we should be thinking about this as well. Oh, so why do we care? Because transportation is the center of the universe and there's absolutely nothing that you can do in your life without transportation. So do you want to be educated? Do you want to have good health care? Do you want to see your friends? Do you want to get that job? Do you want to visit your parents? All of those requires this glue of transportation. And so I work, I've worked in conferences where there's people working whole big wide range of topics and I think whatever your topic is transportation is part of your topic because people cannot get things without this so I think of transportation as your gateway to your life your gateway to opportunity gateway to health gateway to fun and so coming back to this equity piece if we want people to actually live we need to have higher quality multimodal transportation Yeah, I believe that the perspective of looking at it from different life stages is really helpful in understanding how it pertains to all of us at some point in some way, um, whether that be caring for children or elderly people in your um, close circle or yeah, different phases of health. And um, that's very valuable. Which solution excites you right now that could be a both sustainable and affordable solution that is accessible to all? I've been thinking a lot about, we talk about human rights and what are human rights? There's a list of human rights. And one of the human rights that I think we don't talk about very much is 
freedom of movement, and I want to add free movement. So as we have gone down the path of autocentricity, and as we have built that infrastructure and have wide roads with cars rushing across, we have lost the freedom of free mobility. Like without having a driver's license, without having a lot of money, I can actually walk with my two legs and go someplace. Or, and here's where this other piece is, I'm so totally enamored with electric micromobility or e-bikes in that I don't need a driver's license. It is, in some countries we can say it's expensive, but it is not expensive relative to owning a car. It's not expensive relative to building a subway system. It gives people, people love autonomous mobility. People love to move themselves around nimbly, quickly, wherever I want to go. And with bikes, where bikes have come and gone as in popularity, when you talk about, to people about biking, they say, oh, I've got a bad knee. Oh, I don't like to sweat. Oh, I carry heavy things. Oh, I live at the bottom of a hill. With electric bikes, we have taken away almost all of those things. And one thing we can add is, long distances. But we know statistically, through data, <laughs> that, that um, 50% of all trips are less than three miles or five kilometers. And then we can say, I think it's 70% of trips are less than 10 or 11 kilometers. And we know that 70% of all car trips are done alone. And so we have this amazing moment where I think we could shift a large portion of the car driving population or the people who think they want to own a car, I think we could shift them with quality, happiness, joy, access, and mobility with e-bikes. And so we're at this moment, and there's these three things I was just talking with a colleague here that I think we have to do to achieve that. One is we need to subsidize e-bikes for, for those for whom it's expensive. We need to have quality e-bike infrastructure, as in it has to be safe for me to go around. And the third thing, which might be, all these things have to happen, of course, simultaneously, is trial. We need to have a constant way that people can try them. So maybe at your work, maybe in the public square, maybe every Saturday, maybe at schools, maybe at your job, that people can try it and say, oh, my God, I had no idea. I feel like a super athlete and this is so fast, easy, and why would I ever do it any other way? Um, so we need people to try it. But I think all of those things are cost effective, not that hard to do. And I think we can achieve those at this moment. You have completely convinced me. <laughs> I think e-bikes are so fun. Um, but now we're at a conference within another conference, which is the International Transport Forum. So I could imagine that not, not everybody here would uh, be as excited as we are about these sustainable solutions. Let me add, if we, we haven't even talked about climate change, which I would say is my number one issue, and then equitable is the second issue, but of course they're bound 100% to each other many rich governments around the world are hoping to solve the rising CO2 emissions in the transport sector for personal transportation through electric personal cars. And this podcast is too short a time, but I could give you a half hour talk on why that is exactly the wrong solution, that we can move you from your internal combustion engine car into electric car and how fantastic I've reduced your emissions by one third. We still have two thirds of emissions related to the manufacturing, the infrastructure and the maintenance. So moving people to electric cars does not get us to where we need to be in 2030. And then it does all the negative car externalities that we've talked about, the high threshold of what it costs to own one, the fact you have to have a driver's license and you have to have active money to actively pay for fuel and parking. It doesn't solve any of those problems. It doesn't solve congestion. It doesn't solve parking. It doesn't solve access. And I think it adds one new huge problem, which is lithium and cobalt extraction and what that's going to do around the world. Um, a number that I just researched is 
one SUV battery, you could get three Honda Civic batteries, electric batteries, 100 golf carts, or 225 electric bicycles. So if we think of lithium and cobalt as being scarce, valuable resources over which we will be having fighting wars and destroying land and oceans for, don't we want to move 225 people over one person in an SUV? Yes. Yes, we do. And so, again, I think we're at this moment where oh, we could, at this moment, make this transition. And I just want to make clear that in your whole life stages, cars do hold a place. That will be one of the modes that you will travel in, but it will not be the mode that you use for all of your trips. It will be a mode you'll use for a very small fraction of your trips. Mm -hmm. That was a very clear point. Now, I know that uh, in your experience as sitting on different boards and being a CEO, you have probably faced some strong counter arguments as well. Could you tell us a little bit about what you've learned from being in these rooms where not everyone is convinced that we need a different shift right now? Um, yes, I will tell you that my first, I was having my hair cut and the hairdresser said something like, oh, I'm so angry that they took away the parking spaces in front of my shop and now they put in bike lanes. And so I want to say, I am often saying the wrong thing. I said, you're just wrong. That is not the way to win an argument. To start out with saying, you're just wrong, which is how I started the argument. You're just wrong. So um, I, I have been giving to you my, my better answer, which I don't do all the time, which is, oh, think about your own life and how you use things and over the course of your life and here's the trips and wouldn't it be nice if, I think this is a really key point for parents that are taking their children all over. Wouldn't you love it if your 12 to 16 year old could get themselves to school, sports, friends and whatever they're doing? Yes, yes, you would. You'd, you would like to not have to drive in places. And wouldn't you also like your parents to be able to do that? And wouldn't you also like some days on a beautiful spring day to be able to go ride your bike out to go food shopping? Yes, you would. And so I'm trying to, I'm trying to back off of, you need to sell your car, to have you tried an e-bike? Go try an e-bike and see how amazing it is and imagine if your kid could be getting themselves. So I'm really trying to get at things from people's own self-interest. And I... I absolutely believe that it will go a very long way. And I think we can, I think many people will sell their second cars and many people will not buy a first car because of this. And all the while we need to be improving the bike infrastructure and making it harder and more miserable for cars. We have said for a long time, oh, if we build it, people will use it. You know, we have to build these, build out bike lanes or build better pedestrian or build public transit and they'll use it they will only use it if it's better, faster, and more convenient than their personal car. And so we have to make your personal car pay for what it actually is costing society. So uh, yeah, cars should not be getting such easy, free, cheap parking. They should not be paying nothing for their pollution. They should not be getting away free for their enormously heavy weight and how they are very dangerous in cities. So we need to push cars down as we build up this other piece. But I'm going to start with, you personally will love it. Yeah. Try it. That is very compelling. Yeah. How do we achieve this shift at the same time, you know, so that it works, right? Because while we build up the infrastructure and, and create the alternatives, very quickly, we will have to have people let go of personal cars for the majority of their trips. But how, how does that timing work out so that it works? You know what? That's the question I ask everyone when I could <laughs> I ask other people that question. <laughs> um, something that uh, a colleague and I have worked on, and many people have tried this, many politicians, is I'm a deep believer in pilots, And so while people are pushing back, let's close this road down. Let's make bike lanes on these two sides. Let's, you say, it's just a pilot. Don't worry about it. We're just going to try it for three to six months. And you, same thing with congestion pricing. We're just going to try it. And if you don't like it, 
you know, we'll learn some things and we'll improve it. And if you don't like it, we can always stop doing it. It's just a pilot. And I think you get less political pushback and people will still fight you. They will still have to be fighting. But I think it's harder to fight a pilot that you're going to say, we're going to put this on for six months and then rediscuss. And I think once people experience it, the majority will say, yeah, this is better. And there will be some people who will always hate it no matter what. But I think we can pull the majority over when they have been forced to try it. Um, one of the things, a sentence that I have said and I like, which is, people are more than willing to complain about the status quo, right? There was so much, you know, I couldn't get a parking spot. It took me so long to get here because of the congestion. And I can't believe how much new cars cost these days. And the price of fuel is blah, blah, blah. We're complaining, complaining, complain. And I can't stand taking my kid around. Like, I'm just so like, does he have to take piano? But then when you say, let's change, we'll say, oh, I hate change. No, I like, so we hate the status quo, but if you want to change from the status quo, we hate the status quo. We all have a really hard time envisioning the reality of some other life. And particularly when I'm just now an American visiting European cities that have done a vastly better job introducing bicycle infrastructure, although it's a continuing work in progress in different cities as they go around, I will say Americans cannot imagine it. They cannot imagine what a clean, frequent, public transport system looks like. It is just 100% unimaginable. And so where we can do demonstration projects and trial, we need to do them. I think they're hard to do with public transport, but we can do them with congestion pricing. We can do them with bike lanes and re reordering the rights of way on streets. And those demonstration projects are powerful and lets people see, oh, that's what it would look like and feel like, and wow, that is calmer, nicer, better. That brings me right back to my own neighborhood because the main street in my neighborhood was um, full of parked cars and it's where everybody does their shopping, goes to restaurants and does all of their daily daily trips. And in itself, it's a nice like little center, but during the pandemic, some of the parking spots were actually given to the restaurants to have seating outside. And they've never changed it back because it's always populated and it's so yeah, loved by the neighborhood. So I think that's one of the examples that you might be talking about here. Exactly. And I will say in my own neighborhood, in a very small way, this next week, the last day of May and the first few days of June, I've convinced the, my own personal block that we're going to close the street off. And with hay bales, <laughs> we will take away some parking spaces and make some community space and do some activities for five days. And the goal of that is for all the people on the street to say, wow, we lost four parking spaces, but this was so much better. And there was so much less traffic. And I did talk to my neighbors more and there's more spot for children to play. But so it is my sneaky demonstration project on my own block in the city. That is an amazing idea. I think that's also another overlooked social factor of just talking to your neighbors and having a space to do that. It's so missing from most cities. I'm laughing that I'm a person who is very impatient and I'm always wanting to do things fast, fast, fast. Like, And I also want to do it the 80% job and that's quick and I'm the rest I'm not less interested in. But I know people who are community organizers and community activists, and they were telling me, Robin, you, know, you have to build the neighborhood up. You have to start all these. You can't just go out there and say you want to do this transportation thing. So during the pandemic, two times a year, I did have potluck street parties in our driveway and near our house. And I did not once talk about transportation during those six times leading up to this. But in my mind, I was trying to build community so that I could talk to them about the street and transportation. So we did work up to it. That is amazing. It must have been so hard for you, though. <laughs> it was. But what was on a factor in my favor is we have on one block, there are nine children that are less than five years old. So there's a lot of very young children on the street who will be growing up. 
Um, but I would prefer to have the city government tr do projects in a much bigger way. The city government is being helpful to me, but we need to do things, as we said, faster. Um, we have people who have poor access to things today, and we have climate change, and people who own and drive cars think the street is theirs, and it is not. Wow, that is an amazing point to close off. But I have one more question for you. You've made so many amazing points and you're such a role model for especially women in transport, I can tell you from uh, sitting here with you. So, and I know that you see that also as a role that you happily take on to set a good example for women in leadership in the transport sector. So I wanted to ask if you could Talk a little bit about why you think that is important for you. Again, going to your life stage and where you are at this moment, I think at this moment is probably one of the more important things that I can be doing right now is to be encouraging, role modeling, evangelizing on the importance of women in transportation and addressing transportation. Um, I remember... 20 years ago, when I was a young CEO, um, a very famous politician in the U.S. who was the governor of Texas at the time, she gave a talk to all these women, women CEOs, and she said, if you ever get a chance to talk, you must always say yes, because there's too few women, and we need to be out there and making people realize that we're an important part of society. And when she said this, I was a brand new CEO, and I had never done any speaking in my life. And I took it to heart, and she and. I try hard not to say no when I get things. But now at this moment, when I'm 64 years old and I look at the situation that we're in, I think it is important to be a role model. But as I hoped that I've been doing, I'm also trying very hard to be clear that there are, if I say who are my role models right now, my role models are, um, young people in their 30s who are doing amazing things without without being jaded or tired. They're young and fighting the system in new ways that I hadn't thought of and with new technology tools that I hadn't thought of. So my role models really are this rising professionals, absolutely. And so I try to... Um, listen to them instead of wanting to say what I know, <laughs> which is depends, depends on the conversation, and um, really have them tell me new amazing things that I should be doing or using. And so I am listening, and I am impressed by them. Thank you so much, Robin. This was incredible. It was delightful. In case I didn't say before, when I was here at Toomey five years ago, I was so deeply impressed by the lineup of women that came onto the stage after me. And I thought, wow, women are amazing. And, and you could see the, why I love transportation is, it's kind of funny to say in one word, there's one word that covers this huge, gigantic, enormous range of things that can be done. And so those women in all these different fields were so incredibly impressive that I'm really looking forward to, um, being impressed by the set of people who are in this room tomorrow because I know I'm going to be really impressed and I think wow I can't believe you did those things in that amazing way. Thank you very much to our remarkable guest Robin Chase and to all the listeners for joining us on this enlightening episode. This episode is part of a series of interviews featuring the remarkable feminist voices in transport 2023 as part of the larger feminist voices in transport campaign aligned with Toomey's annual focus this year. We hope that our conversation has inspired you and expanded your passion for sustainable mobility. And as we conclude, we leave you with the profound words of Robin. Infrastructure is destiny, serving as a reminder that the choices we make today will shape the world we inhabit tomorrow. Stay tuned for more exciting episodes to come and keep advocating for sustainable mobility systems for all. Thank you very much.